In the far-off future, a spaceship called Ark-1 faces a big disaster. This makes the rest of the crew wake up a whole year earlier than planned for their new home, Proxima B. Now they're missing their leaders and don't have much stuff to use. The crew must stick together to keep going the right way and make it through. Out in deep space, a spaceship full of sleeping pods shakes a lot. A beam falls and hits one pod, waking up Lieutenant Sharon Garnet from her icy nap. She sees a huge hole in the ship and hurries to put on her special suit. Then she wakes up everyone else. Sharon finds Lieutenant Spencer Lane and tells him what's going on. They quickly get everyone out of the dangerous area, helping them with their suits and helmets. Meanwhile, another chunk of metal smashes into Commander Susan Ingram's pod, trapping her inside. Baylor Trent tries to lift the heavy structure, but Sharon pulls him away from the danger, making him put on his helmet and dash to safety. As the ceiling collapses, everyone starts floating around because gravity disappears. Sharon struggles to lock the sleeper pod bay due to something blocking the ship's external wheel. After a tough effort, she manages to release it, and the wheel starts spinning again bringing back gravity. Sharon quickly restarts the ship's life support system, letting everyone breathe without their helmets. With gravity back, Sharon and Spencer rush to update their leaders about the crisis, only to find their bay completely wrecked. In the med bay, Dr. Sanjivni Kabir takes care of the crew members, advising them not to believe any rumors about the disaster. She helps Angus Medford, who deactivates his suit too early, causing his weak muscles from cryostasis to keep him from walking. In the midst of chaos aboard the spaceship, Sharon ventures into the med bay, where she discovers Lieutenant James Bryce immersed in an ice bath. With a sense of urgency, she informs him of the need to assist her in controlling the bridge. As they navigate towards the command center, James suggests deferring to one of the commanders, but Sharon's solemn revelation extinguishes that hope they're all deceased. Elsewhere, Eva diligently attends to charging the crew helmets, assigning Jasper Dades the task of refilling tanks. His refusal, citing it as beneath his role, creates tension. Harris stealthily slips inside, prompting Eva to swiftly close the door to avoid prying eyes, mindful of the ship's ban on couples. Their tender moment is abruptly halted by an order to assemble in the mess hall. Meanwhile, Angus finds his way to the hall, where he settles beside Alicia Nevins, a specialist in West Management. In conversation, Angus discloses his background in horticulture, prompting Alicia's recollection of him as the individual who cultivated crops in the Mojave Desert. The news delivered by the three lieutenants, announcing another year's journey to reach Proxima B, elicits collective horror among the crew. Sharon tells everyone they don't know what hit the ship, and Spencer adds that their sleeping areas got wrecked, they lost their storage, and there's hardly any water left. Sharon says they'll have to use the water machine differently, and until then, they must be really careful with how much they use. She mentions they lost a lot of their food, only having enough for six weeks. Sharon reveals they don't have any commanders left, just the three lieutenants. She makes herself the leader, even though the guys question it. Sharon explains she knows the ship best, so she's the best choice. Spencer doesn't look happy, but Sharon talks to everyone, saying they were all picked to save humanity and encourages them to stay strong. The next day, they hold a sad ceremony to honor their commanders. Baylor gets approached about his relationship with Commander Susan, which makes him upset. Meanwhile, James praises Sharon for her inspiring words from the night before. Yet he's not okay with her declaring herself the leader. Sharon defends herself, saying she had to step up when no one else did. Angus catches up with Sharon and asks her to follow him. After the funeral, the crew gathers in the mess hall for breakfast. Jasper explains they'll only get 500 calorie meals twice a day to save food. Meanwhile, Angus takes Sharon to the storage area and reveals a container of fertile soil he brought from Earth. He plans to grow crops, but needs power for his LED lights. At the same time, Kat sneaks into the women's locker room to shower. However, Felix, the head of security, catches her. Kat tries to talk her way out of it, but Felix doesn't budge and gives her a towel instead. Afterwards, Alicia hurries to the storage unit and discovers Angus working on his biofarm setup. Realizing her expertise in waste management, Angus requests her help with the fertilizer ingredients, surprising her. Meanwhile, Baylor watches a vintage family video when Spencer interrupts him. Baylor questions Spencer about any regrets regarding their mission volunteering, but Spencer reaffirms his commitment, especially considering the people relying on them back home. Suddenly, the lights flicker off, and a crew member alerts Spencer that Sharon redirected power to the biofarm, sparking his frustration. In the storage area, they illuminate the space to initiate farming activities. Spencer bursts in, reproaching Sharon for greenlighting the risky biofarm project without consulting the other lieutenants. Sharon apologizes, but admonishes him for addressing the matter publicly. Later, the lieutenants, joined by Dr. Kabir, Felix, and Ava, along with former counsel James, debate the merits of farming. James supports 
supports the initiative as a solution to the food crisis, while Spencer argues they're squandering valuable resources. Sharon counters, emphasizing that every decision carries risks and underscores the necessity of tough choices for survival. Afterward, Sharon returns to the storage unit and encourages Angus to press on with the biofarm. Meanwhile, Eva heads down to the engineering unit where she encounters Harris. She stresses the urgent need to rebuild the water recycling unit. When the lights flicker back on, she directs the team to gather the necessary parts to fix the system. In the medical bay, Baylor seeks out Dr. Kabir for a checkup and admits to experiencing difficulty breathing. Suddenly, an alarm blares, signaling oxygen depletion on the ship. Dr. Kabir swiftly hands Baylor a mask and rushes to retrieve their helmets. All crew members activate their suits and scramble for their helmets. Unfortunately, Ava and her engineering team get separated by a closing door, as does Baylor and Dr. Kabir on the bridge. James briefs Sharon about the ship's lockdown protocol, triggered by oxygen levels dropping below 15%. He informs everyone that the diagnostics are malfunctioning and orders them to locate the chief of life support. Spencer departs with a crew member to investigate the problem. Sharon locates Jasper Dades as the head of life support and pages him urgently. In the medical bay, Baylor struggles to breathe but manages to find the oxygen tanks. Meanwhile, Ava, realizing their helmets are out of oxygen on one side while hers are charged, orders Harris to open the door immediately. Jasper, upon hearing Sharon's message, hides and observes Spencer and the crew trying to locate the anomaly. Attempting to escape, Jasper runs into Felix, who's also searching for him. Witnessing one of the engineering crew members faint, Harris removes his helmet to assist, promising Eva he'll be fine, but she urges him to conserve his air. Ava calls for assistance from the bridge, but James informs Sharon they can't open the door without access to the life support system. Felix eventually brings Jasper to the bridge, where Jasper pretends his helmet is malfunctioning to avoid hearing orders. They provide him with a new helmet, but he tries to flee only to be apprehended by Felix and compelled to repair the system. In the med bay, Baylor reconfigures the door lock to facilitate entry and assistance. In the hallway, Baylor discreetly stashes some of the tanks inside a chute and then encounters Dr. Kabir, joining forces with with her to rescue the engineering team. Meanwhile, Jasper drops a bombshell, confessing that he's not the real Jasper Dades, but actually Malcolm Perry. James, incensed, orders Felix to arrest him while Sharon directs Einstein to locate anyone with advanced coding skills to address the issue. On the art deck, Harris professes his love for Eva before collapsing. Thankfully, Dr. Kabir and her team arrive, providing oxygen masks and immediate medical attention. Later, Ensign brings three crew members, including Alicia, to the bridge. Alicia discerns that the diagnostics are stuck in a barstow loop and successfully navigates the system out of it. Sharon then commands Spencer to venture outside the ship to seal the breach, a task they swiftly execute. With relief, Sharon joyfully announces the resolution of their oxygen crisis. In the med bay, Eva observes Dr. Kabir's efforts to save Harris, but sadly, he succumbs to his condition. Dr. Kabir expresses her condolences to Eva, who walks away in sorrow. Dr. Kabir then notices Baylor and offers her gratitude for his assistance. At the bridge, Sharon commends Alicia for her adept handling of the crisis, and James, impressed, promotes her as the new chief of life support. Later, Felix escorts Sharon to a storage closet where Malcolm is detained. Malcolm confesses to manipulating the situation to be on the first ship and explains his actions regarding the real Jasper Dades. Sharon informs him of the council's impending decision, leaning towards the death penalty. Shocked, Malcolm reveals the presence of other stowaways aboard. As Sharon is about to leave, Malcolm halts her, recounting a meeting with her and a cadet named Denise in a Jacksonville pub and referencing a tragic event that deeply affected Sharon. The council convenes to deliberate Malcolm's fate and Dr. Kabir argues for his right to defend himself. Himself. They agree, but Felix discovers Malcolm has been murdered. Sharon retreats to her room to contemplate Malcolm's revelations, and with this concluding the first episode. The next day, Spencer and James investigate the damage outside Arc 1, seeking the cause. Sharon spots a separation in the structure of the external wheel and urgently orders them to retreat. Unfortunately, debris strikes, rendering Spencer unconscious, while their companion, Sholnik, tragically loses his life. James brings Spencer back aboard the ship, and Dr. Kabir attempts to revive him. A distraught James confesses to Sharon that he couldn't keep his promise to Sholnik's wife to keep him alive. Later in the med bay, Dr. Kabir attends to Spencer's concussion when Alicia arrives for her post-cryophysical examination. A crew member, who's been waiting for over three hours with other patients, approaches them, questioning why Alicia needs an examination when she seems fine. The crew member then criticizes Alicia's promotion and mentions a rumor she heard about Alicia supposedly killing Jasper to take over his position. Dr. Kabir instructs the crew member to take a seat, but Alicia interrupts, sharing rumors she heard about the ship being attacked. 
Visibly annoyed, Dr. Kabir sharply tells Alicia to be quiet, prompting Alicia to leave the room. Dr. Kabir confides in Spencer that she hasn't been able to rest since their emergence from hibernation, as she's the sole remaining doctor. Spencer orders her to secure the medical bay and get some rest before he leaves. James catches up to Spencer, discussing the improved structure's stability and reminiscing about Sholnik. Spencer expresses concern that more rumors will spread following Sholnik's death and insists they must inform the crew of the truth but James believes they're just as uninformed. Elsewhere, Alicia encounters Baylor and thanks him for helping her secure her former position. Alicia offers to give him a tour of the waste facility, but realizing her slip, she hastily walks away, feeling flustered. Later, they gather for a solemn funeral service to honor the crew members lost during the oxygen crisis. Ava reflects on her final moments with Harris and expresses her contempt for Malcolm's corpse, witnessed by Kat. Before they can dispose of the bodies into space, Angus intervenes. He approaches the council and proposes using the human remains as fertilizer, but Spencer vehemently opposes the idea, ordering the bodies to be ejected. However, Alicia steps in, prompting Spencer to question her authority. Sharon reveals that James promoted Alicia after the crisis, emphasizing the need for collective decision-making. Spencer, once again overruled, storms out in frustration. While the rest of the group leaves, the three lieutenants remain behind. Sharon explains that aside from needing to repair the engines, they now have a murderer on board, and they are still unaware of what caused the damage to their ship. Overwhelmed, Spencer exits the room, followed by James, who agrees with Sharon about the importance of finding out what struck them. However, Spencer harbors suspicions about Sharon because she never underwent training with them and only joined the crew three days before Arc-1 began its journey. Five years prior, Lieutenant Commander Susan Ingram introduced the crew to a hologram of William Trust, the man behind the spaceship's design and the Arc program. James comments on Trust's untrustworthy nature, citing his God complex and dismissal from his own company due to erratic behavior. Despite Spencer and Baylor's agreement, Commander Leslie interrupts the recording and announces their departure as the scorched earth looms in the background. Later, Kat, the celebrity face of Arc-1, informs the press that she will continue sharing her experiences until they enter stasis. Leslie, accompanied by Susan, meets with Spencer and Baylor, introducing them to Sharon. As Leslie and Sharon depart, Susan and Baylor briefly touch hands. Spencer questions Susan about Sharon's last-minute inclusion in their team, but Susan attributes it to a decision from higher-ups. In the present, James acknowledges Spencer's point, and they decide to head to their room to rest. However, once there, they start arguing about who should get the sleeping quarters, given there are only two crew sleeping chambers and Sharon has already claimed one. Later, Felix catches Sharon attempting to access the storage closet where Malcolm was murdered. Sharon explains that the entrance logs have been erased, making it impossible to identify Malcolm's killer. Felix, conducting an investigation, reminds her that everyone is a potential suspect, but Sharon feels accused. When Felix asks who else has the clearance to erase the logs on the security pad, she names Spencer, James, and Ava. In the storage bay, Angus witnesses a burst pipe and struggles to contain it in time. He informs Sharon that they've lost a significant amount of water, and he tried to find Ava to help recover it, but couldn't locate her. Sharon goes to the crew's sleeping quarters and discovers Ava in bed, sobbing. She also notices Kat and asks for her assistance in comforting Ava. Kat engages Ava in conversation, helping her navigate through her grief. At the bridge, James and Spencer attempt to review the camera footage from the incident that interrupted their hibernation, only to discover that the cameras malfunctioned at the time. Felix interrupts, questioning Spencer about his whereabouts during Malcolm's murder. Infuriated, Spencer rebuffs Felix's interrogation, asserting that he has no authority to question him, and storms off. In the storage bay, Alicia assists Angus in draining the water when they come across a knife. Angus deduces that it could be the murder weapon, theorizing that someone hid it in the water tank where it became lodged in the pipes. Later, Eva returns to her crew and directs them to reclaim the water. Sasha suggests that Eva take some time off to grieve, but Eva insists that she is the only one qualified to lead them through the crisis. At the bridge, James and Spencer inform Sharon that they plan to conduct another survey outside the ship. Sharon urges them to assign the task to someone else, emphasizing their importance and the risks involved, but they dismiss her concerns. Meanwhile, Angus meets with Felix in the mess hall to discuss the knife. Felix confirms it as the murder weapon, but their conversation is interrupted when an irate crew member attempts to steal water rations. Felix intervenes, leading to a brawl. Sharon arrives and assists Felix in subduing the instigators. 
Afterward, the three lieutenants discuss how to handle the situation without a brig to confine the troublemakers. Sharon highlights that everyone on board is on edge due to sleep deprivation, hunger, and thirst, and believes that their anger is a symptom of deeper issues that need addressing. She heads to the sleeping quarters to find Kat, who she appoints as the head of shipwide mental health. Sharon orders Kat to conduct therapy sessions for those in need. However, Kat objects, claiming she's unqualified. Sharon threatens to reassign her to waste management unless she agrees to the role with a few conditions. After James conducts an external inspection of the ship, with Spencer overseeing from inside, he notices an unusual melted appearance around the breach. Within it, he discovers diamond-like substances lodged inside. When he tries to retrieve a piece, it immediately melts through his gloves, exposing his fingers to the void of space. James hastily retreats inside while Spencer restores cabin pressure. They head to the medical bay, where Dr. Kabir tends to James's frostbitten fingers, reassuring him that his skin will regenerate. Sharon enters, sparking a discussion about their frayed nerves due to lack of sleep. She proposes a plan for everyone to take turns resting and announces to the entire crew that sleep shifts are now mandatory. Meanwhile, at the water storage facility, Eva insists that all members of the engineering department continue their duties without interruption. Later, James and Spencer return to their room to find Kat decorating, much to their dismay. Sharon had given their quarters to Kat for her therapy sessions. James then asks Yellen if he can sleep beside her, assuring her there will be no funny business. Meanwhile, Angus offers Spencer his bed, but Spencer opts to sleep in the biofarm instead. At the same time, Eva is disappointed to find that the water tank has not reached the desired pressure to sustain its operation. As Sharon lies in bed, she gazes at a picture of herself and a man, wishing he were there to offer counsel. Moments later, Eva calls for an emergency meeting, announcing that her team has managed to get the water reclamation system running at 62% efficiency. However, they had to divert water from other sectors, including the coolant system, giving them only two days worth of drinking water. With what remains in store, Sharon calculates they have a total of four days worth of water left. Spencer then voices his concern about the knife damaging the pipe, surprising Felix, as he never disclosed the location where the murder weapon was found. Suddenly, they hear the engine shut down, and Ava reveals that they turned off the engine coolant, opting to prioritize a few extra days of drinking water over running the engines while adrift in space. And thus, episode two concludes. So ladies and gentlemen, in this series comprising 10 episodes, we will delve deeper into the adventurous journey of individuals onboarded. Our aim is to reach 500 likes on this video. We hope you found it enjoyable and insightful. Thank you for tuning in.